if you have any more questions for him, uh, drop us in the DR, and that way that's best to join the subject. Thank you very much indeed for the invite. Um, Simon said it's a real privilege to be here. And um, we were saying at the break, we, it goes without saying, we learn, I reckon we learn more from coming to events like this than probably most people will do on you know, at the tables. Like we genuinely do. Um, what I've been asked to talk about is, um, can you hear me at the back? Shall I use the microphone? Yeah. Well, been asked to, I've been asked to talk about long-term outcomes in Aerectum Affirmations IA. Um, what do we know and what do we need to find out? The emphasis really is on the second bit. Um, just really to quote uh, Greg and Justin Kelly from just a few minutes ago, um, this is really central to what I want to say. Um, Justin Kelly uh, was saying to Greg that uh, we're sorry that we didn't fix you, we just fixed you as best we can. Now there's a big difference there. It's really important for people, as, fa as parents, to get what the likelihood is going to be. So you've got realistic expectations, and that's not to be negative. That, that means you can anticipate problems as they come along, earlier, more precisely. But it also means that as you go along, if problems do happen, it doesn't mean that you start beating yourself up or we as clinicians beat ourselves up. And it makes it more like a partnership. So outcomes, we know, we all know in this room, outcomes for um, your children, our patients, are always better where there's proper partnership, which is, I guess, the point of, of this meeting. So if we can be realistic up front with... Uh, uh, families of newborn or newly diagnosed uh, children with any problem, but particularly things like anorectal malformations where people don't talk about it generally, then it means that we can move forward in a much more effective way. So, a few facts and figures. Um, there's a group from Scandinavia that I'd say we all really respect, very impressive group, um, led by a guy called Rintala. And He's very interested in long-term follow-up. And um, as you can see, it's not a massively sophisticated table where we're, di we're separating people between those with a normal outcome, good outcome, fair and poor. But that's because some things are really hard to measure and quantify, aren't they? You know, it's very hard to square a circle. And actually, even with all those brains, you end up boiling it down to those four outcomes. Now, if you look at the actual outcomes, they're not brilliant, you know, and, but this is all comers with anorectal malformations. So don't be looking at that and thinking how it would necessarily relate to your own child, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But what it does show is that there is a range of outcomes, and there is a significant proportion, about a quarter, where the outcome in some series is described as being poor. Now, if you go back um, a few decades before, you know, 1982, when Penny developed this operation, people were doing a different approach. And as you'll see, when you look at the same outcomes, they're almost exactly the same then. So to the gentleman that asked about, in a very considered way, what are the most exciting things on the horizon surgically, actually I felt slightly embarrassed with that because since I've been a trainee and then a consultant, things move forward in a much more glacial way than you might expect for maybe oncology or some aspects of cardiology. And there are good reasons for that because, you know, there's not a whole load of investment that goes into research or whatever for certain things. But actually, there is so much that we don't know about anorectal malformations. If we can partner with you, we can take it forward in a much more sustainable way. And I agree with the art that the, the, the the answer to you about being able to uh, visualise nerves, but it would be nice to just move it forward even further and just think what the actual gaps are in our outcomes, what are the knowledge gaps and what are the outcome gaps that we really need to focus on. Um, so I'm just going to take you through a, a couple of studies that I think are, are, are worth considering. This group is from Melbourne. Um, um, I, I, 
Yeah. Must be pretty good. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I couldn't tell what he said, but I think he said. <laughs> so Russell Taylor is what is described as, somebody described him as a careful surgeon. It's a funny thing to say, but he doesn't take risks. He's, um, he's a very, you know, honourable chap and he's a good scientist. When he says something, you know, you can believe it. He's not trying to make a point. So this isn't peer-reviewed with quite the rigour that a lot of papers are. Now that sounds square, but when you peer-review a paper, you're meant to show it to a load of people that anonymously critique it. Um, this has been peer-reviewed, but actually what I'm saying is I trust what he does. Um, and um, I know the other, the other authors. And what they did is they put a load of effort into a long-term um, outcome study. Um, uh, for, as you see, a big, a big sort of uh, date range, and they identified 355, uh, th sorry, 353 pa uh, patients that had had surgery for anal rectum malformations in Melbourne over a long period of time. And you look at how these Evening patients group, fell out of the system. Uh, they couldn't contact some of them. Um, some people, for understandable reasons, chose not to answer a 70 point questionnaire also get the point that if you ask a three-point questionnaire, it comes back with inadequately detailed data. So there's a real skill to getting long-term follow-up. But they, they did this, and it must have taken an awful lot of effort and a lot of resource. And they found that children, uh, that adults had impaired sensation. This is all comers, low as well as high in rectum malformations. Impaired sensation in 40% nearly. Urgency, where when they got to go, they got to go in three quarters. Trouble holding back stool in 40%. Consonants aids were used in 30%, and there's about a third that have problems with soiling in consonants. That, that's all up. Um, and there was also a significant problem with wetting in about a third, which is a bigger number than I would have, have anticipated. But if you look in detail, that's a common theme for high rather than low abnormalities. Um, interestingly, as uh, Greg was saying, when you become an adult, then the processes around you seem to dissolve. So it's even more important that what you're gonna learn from psychology and the business of having ownership of your own lives, ownership of your own problems, and working with clinical teams, trusting us enough, but not completely, that's the way to go, that's the way it should be. And it means that when you become an adult, you've got this concept called self-efficacy, which means we're all equal, so that you can manage your own problems effectively and early. But only 40% um, only were, were actually having regular follow-up, despite them having problems very frequently. So that's an important thing. And that last point, um, somebody made a quote that it affects the whole family and not just the patients. Now, everybody in the room will get that, and we were just saying before at the break, as well as, par as, as, well as the child with the problem, uh, as well as that, there's parents, and there's the interaction between the parents. I mean, it's hard enough bringing up a family anyway. So you've, you've got to think about siblings, and actually, little things like that, if we were smarter, we'd be able to say, you know, maybe these are one or two tips that you might want to take into account when your child's going into school, like Alan's going to talk about, or when they're at school and there's a bit of bullying, you know, you can predict that with any child. So it might just, those simple things might make a bigger difference than anything that we can do surgically in the next five years, although it'd be great if we did do something very smart. Um, so what do we know? Christina Kirkland has been uh, referenced a couple of times. Um, she, she did, as well as, show, you know, Few people now, Pena and Levitt, have shown that the higher the defect, almost the bigger the effect on the, the whole pelvis and the muscles, the innervation, so they do have more problems. But what we often fail to do as clinicians is we often forget to define what's normal, right? Sounds like a really obvious thing, but if you can't define normal, you can't define abnormal. You can't say something's abnormal. So then you can't focus your effort on picking up problems, right? Sounds dead obvious, but in the scrabble to publish papers that, you know, we all, we all inhabit the real world, right? And so as a clinician, 
if you think you're also a bit of a scientist, you're meant to be publishing papers. And so there's always a bit of pressure to, to, to do things, but getting control data is really difficult. Now what this lady did is that they contacted 1,850 uh, normal children from the age of, I think, four up into their thirties, and they asked about their normal continence rates. Now that was useful because it means that you can say, so what are the outcomes for low anorectal malformation and the effect on their quality of life compared to a normal child? So that was very considered, and in my view, proper science. And what they demonstrated, it, they're probably, I can just tell you what the table shows. <laughs> if you've got a low anorectal malformation, you probably aren't going to have major problems in terms of your continence in about half the patients in comparison to peers, you know, age for age. However, if you've got a high ma ma malformation, you know, a more severe defect, you probably will have. And that's what it is, and that's what we have to, to work on. So that was very useful information. So normal data are important. So what should we know? So I've talked a little bit about what we do know, just to build on what Simon said previously about the actual numbers for different outcomes. What, what should we know? Well, what we all want to know, you know, in a, in a clinic with parents and a clinician, we want to be able to say what the likely outcome is for your own child. So we want to say something specific to your child, not just because of the level of their anorectal malformation, but just what the muscles look like, but also whether they've got a spinal abnormality and what the sacrum's like. It's a complicated thing. That's why we can't give you a specific number sometimes. We can give you an idea. It needs to be accurate. Now, if you, if you have a surgeon asking his own or her own patients what the outcome's likely to be, we know that it's very common that good outcomes are over-reported. And so that you have somebody um, who's separate to the clinical team, that no, there's no doubt that anything is going to be fed back in a way that's negative, people are a lot more honest. And if you do outcome studies with a psychologist that knows how to phrase the questions in a way that's unambiguous and clear, and people don't feel like they, they're supposed to do anything other than just give the truth, you get much better, cleaner information. And that's what we should be aspiring to. So to do that, we have to trust each other. We've got to trust you that you won't be cross at us if our outcomes don't seem to be as good as people that, you know, are in another country that they might be almost be seeing this like a business. Do, do you know what I mean? <laughs> On the other hand, we also have to be open to the fact that we're all imperfect. So if there is a gap in our outcomes, we've got to be able to work on how to move it forward. And that's the way it works. So, so that's that. It has to be specific to our centre rather than a surgeon because we don't work in isolation. Simon said at the beginning he was privileged to work within a team. I work with it. We all work within a team with psychologists, with clinical nurse specialists, with a secretary that's nice to you on the phone when you ring up to say why haven't I been seen in clinic. It's all really important. So the outcome should be specific to the broader service and pick up all of those things. Also, specific to your priorities. When I say you, it's a funny thing. It shouldn't be us and them, but priorities of the people that we work for. So that's predominantly the patients, the parents, and the siblings, both <coughs> individuals and the whole groups. So just to make that a bit clearer, um, what seems to be most important to families in some studies is the need to do dilatations. Now, that's... That was a very striking thing to me when I read this paper. It's a brilliant paper written by a patient group and published by a patient group. And it was just, it was one of those memorable publications that I just thought was brilliant. To them, the thing that stressed them most was whether or not to do dilatations. Now, if it didn't make any difference, just like was being said before, we shouldn't do it. My personal view is that whoever said, it was Pena, said we should do dilatations, it wasn't particularly evidence-based, but there was probably a good reason to do it. We might just not need to do it as often or for as long. But I don't have an answer for how often or as long, and I think that is worthy of a study. Um, function down the line. Um, sexual function is very important. As Alan said, 
um, uh, um, about, you know, you don't think of your 18 year olds as being somebody that's going to have ongoing, you know, something that they need to think about in terms of sexual function. But it is so important to think about your own lives, you know. If you didn't have that, that would be a very important miss. <clears throat> if we can manage that to a degree, or at least predict it and do something about it as best we can, that, that would be important. So what else should we know? There's four types of outcomes. I, I don't want to get too, too square about this. Patient experience is obviously important. If we improve patient experience, every other outcome improves. So as well as being humane, you work better together and you're earlier picking up problems. So that's why it's in, in, in bold. That's obvious, we're in this room, that's obvious. There are three other outcomes that we should also think about. Typical outcomes are things like continence rates, and that's really obvious, or survival rates for some diseases. Um, they're, they're obvious, but also process, how often you need to come to clinic, what the point is of coming to clinic, whether or not you do dilatations, those things are important. Um, and finally, this is the one that's probably the least sexy, but just as important. There's a slide from the States with a kid that's had cardiac surgery with a sternotomy, you know, a, a midline incision over the sternum, that they put on bus shelters trying to generate money for, um, for a good cause. So a lot of money goes to cardiac surgery, and I can completely understand that. This isn't trying to begrudge that, but um, we all are responsible for the care of someone who doesn't have the ability to show off their scar in the same way. So if we're going to be smart about how we obtain resource and leverage in order to move research forward and clinical care forward, we've got to be savvy about what makes a difference to the people that hold the purse strings. So there's no point forgetting about resource use. That's not to do with hospital managers. They're part of the team as well if we're going to be smart. Um, technical stuff about long-term outcomes, um, before you do anything, you should think about what's actually known. To do that requires knowledge synthesis, that's a technical term, but to pay someone to do it, because let's face it, I'm no expert in this, right, I really am not. I, you know, Al and I were supposed to finish off a paper on the way down today, we've got as far as that. Um, it, you have to have real expertise to do this properly. And it costs a lot of money. It costs as much as a Range Rover to do a proper knowledge synthesis thing. Now, we don't have that kind of money, but if you did that, then you would properly have all the bits and pieces in place to give you some answers you might need to the long term outcome. We need to clearly define what we mean by constipation or incontinence or sexual function. I mean, it's easy to manage to, to, to measure your urine, your renal function, but there are other things that it's better quality of life isn't that easy to measure. Um, what are we actually trying to measure? Well, we've got to ask you what you need us to measure, but do it in a really structured way. And there are people with expertise in quality of research that can help with that. What we find has got to be actionable. It's no good just having information and then sitting on it. We've got to do something with it, and we've got to be responsible to do that. We've got to know what's normal, like I said. Um, when a consultant may be in post for 20 years, so by the time um, we retire, our patients are just graduating into their 20s. So we've got to be smart enough to think about the consultants that are coming through, just going through medical school now and having things set up so what they do, they hit the ground running. So we have to do that together. This isn't just a meeting for today. This is something that needs to last for a few decades, really. Forever. Forever. Um, and real world outcomes, real time use. It sounds like something from a Lincoln political placard, but <laughs> real world outcomes, they're important. People often publish things because they are a very influential or big centre. What matters to us is how your own patient's gonna, gonna do or your own child's gonna do within the centre that you're at, within, you know, we've got, we've got to be able to produce data that reflect the reality not just the sort of massive centres. And that does happen to a degree. And we have to be smart enough to be able to do real-time use. So if somebody gives me data about a patient that I'm seeing next week, 
that means that I'd like to just put it back straight into our nurse specialist so we can set up a couple of things so that when they come to clinic, we get the maximum use. But trying to find time to build that kind of system takes a lot of thought. So in summary, high abnormalities give you, when you measure it against normal children, normal children, it's the wrong term, normal function, children with high abnormalities tend to have problems compared to them in terms of their consonants, fecal and to a degree urinary consonants. If you've got a low abnormality, it's pretty good in around the half. Of the others, a lot of them have constipation and a few will have problems with incontinence. Accurate information, as well as being useful for all of us to be able to have um, manageable, managed expectations, would allow us to see where the knowledge gaps are, so the known unknowns, that Donald Rumsfeld thing. But to develop a mechanism to collect this takes thought, resource, and care. And that's it, thank you. I just, want to, I just want to say one quick thing. With the um, adult living with adults group, we've um, collaborated with uh, Dr. Bischoff and one of the psychologists at um, Denver, Colorado, and that we did a, um, a survey from the adult group, and that's going to be released next week um, at their conference. So there's going to be a lot, a, a good update with Guardian specific from adults. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Jonathan will be here again this afternoon, so uh, 